So the, at the last session, we didn't have any actual direct questions posted in the car park space. But what we did was we posted a link to a midterm evaluation and the team have decided to look through those and, and pick out any sort of common points that were raised through that evaluation. We don't have time, obviously, to go over every individual comment, but what we have sort of gathered them into some sort of common themes and we will go over some of them with you just now. There was also a question posed in the chat pane at the last session and we're going to come into that one very shortly. So just looking at some of the points, we'll just go through them in turn. We can't um, promote or endorse commercial products, but we do know that textbooks are widely used across establishments and local authorities. What we as a team are promoting is to teach for real depth of understanding and to encourage learners to demonstrate that understanding in a variety of ways. On the Padlet we, that we provide with you, and we'll talk about the Padlet um, at the end of the session, but we do provide a Padlet that gives you links to lots of websites that we would recommend that you can then explore a wee bit further. Because we know that if you rely sometimes on Google, it takes you down a rabbit hole and then you forget what you were looking for in the first place. So we've tried to make that a wee bit easier by providing some links that we have used and therefore um, quality assured to a certain degree. So hopefully that answers that, that one for you. The next um, question or sort of common question that came up through that evaluation was about sort of more sessions looking at individual levels. And you'll see that question coming up in the, the slides just now. We think this is already the offer for the newly qualified teachers and the one that you're joining is already quite a comprehensive offer. And we're actually quite a small team. Um, so there's only really three of us that are, that are dealing with the primary section. So we don't in all honesty, have the capacity to deliver individual se sessions by level. We also appreciate it's really important sharing with you the progression of skills and knowledge across levels so that you have the tools to offer support and challenge to your learners. And also you might change stage next year. So we're hoping that the sessions that we provide may um, give you that grounding when you move on. But the final point that I would say for that one is if there is something in particular you do have a regional officer um, attached to your local authority and it may be that you want to have a separate conversation with them or discuss it at the drop-in sessions, which I'll come on to very, very shortly. So the drop-in sessions was a popular one in the midterm evaluation and not everybody was aware of those. So we're going to go over that in a wee bit more detail in the next slide So and, and give you those details. So we'll just move on from that one just now, if that's OK. Again, another important one and another one that we're asked um, quite often. It's really important that we are absolutely fully confident as practitioners that learners can demonstrate their learning, they can explain their thinking, they can justify their choices and apply their thinking in different contexts. And we also know that there are other presentations that our secondary colleagues are providing right now. So if you feel you do have able learners in your, um, your class that are working at that beyond second level, it would be good to look at those other presentations that you have access to via the Padlet that I mentioned earlier on, because that would start from early level, uh, second level, sorry, and take that beyond second level. So it might be worth tapping into those presentations. It would also be worthwhile um, to speak to your teacher peers and also your secondary colleagues that are attached to your cluster. And finally, the last point on this um, is about that kind of differentiation, which again, we spoke about at one of the earlier sessions. What we would be promoting for this one um, is having those open-ended starters, which we quite often include in our presentations. These open-ended starters can be accessed by all learners at different levels. And this minimises the planning for you, so it's one starter that can be accessed by all learners, hopefully. And also, if you're operating with different ability groups, consider teaching the same concept with support and challenge um, incorporated, as opposed to teaching different concepts, so teaching time for one group and algebra for another group and maybe times tables um, across different groups. So that's probably most of the common themes that come out through the midterm evaluation. And just a very final point, um, I see Jacqueline's put, or about to put, sorry, um, maybe the, the link to the midpoint survey back up again, because I know maybe not all people either attended or were able to fill in that midpoint survey, but it would be really beneficial for us and we would really appreciate it if you can either scan the code that you can see on the screen just now, or we'll pop a wee link into the chat. It's not too late to fill in that midterm evaluation, but it really does help us identify how to make the programme as effective as possible. 
Thanks, Jacqueline, for popping that into the chat. So just talking about those drop-in sessions, what you'll see on the slide just now is the drop-in session details. It includes how to join the team and any associated dates for the regional drop-in sessions. We've highlighted on the screen just now what the jo joining code is for each team and the dates of those sessions. Included on the slide is the RIC, the Regional Improvement Collaborative that your local authority belongs to. And these are sort of common questions that we've been asked in the past. Just a wee point about the drop-in sessions before we move on. The main aim of the drop-in sessions is to provide a safe space for you guys to meet each other, to find out where the resources will be stored and ask any questions which might, which might support your planning of anything related to numeracy and maths. We are hoping that these will be good opportunities for people to meet, chat and support each other. They're very informal in approach and therefore we do not record the sessions and that's just to allow people to come along and share and speak freely. There's also a link at the bottom of the screen that you'll see just now and what that um, link will take you to is a bit of information about how to access teams and how to join a team if maybe you're not as familiar with that process. So this is one that you might want to revisit um, beyond the session. Thank you. So we don't normally, if you've been to the sessions in the past, we don't normally outline the aims of the session because the, the associated experiences and outcomes kind of suggest what the content is going to be. But because there are no specific curric uh, curriculum organisers or exper experiences and outcomes related to problem solving directly, we thought we would share these with you just now. So we'll, I'm just going to pause for just a, a minute to let you sort of take those in. And what we're really promoting, and it's, it's the most important thing I think that you can probably take away from tonight's session, is that problem solving should be embedded across all areas and shouldn't be seen as a separate entity. And we'll unpick that a little bit as we go through the session tonight. But just to get us started, we're going to take um, a wee bit of time just to look at these images. And if you can please note in the chat pane how these images are the same but different. And the focus here in the keyword is but so what, what are the same but different? So I'm going to just pause again to let you have a wee go at that. And if you can pop anything that you see, what, any thoughts that you have, any comments into the chat pane, that would be really helpful. Great, thank you. I can see some comments coming through now. Thank you. Great. Yep. These are all great. Thank you so much. And just a wee point about how, and just keep put, putting those into the chat as I'm, I'm speaking. One of the ways that um, you might want to present this to your learners is do exactly what I did and just show the image and pose the question. And then that pause is really important. And I know I find that quite difficult sometimes. And I did in a classroom as well. You feel as if you need to jump in, but hold back a little bit and see what the learners come up with. Have, the, have your learners think about it for maybe a minute or two. You'll know yourself when is a, a, a sort of good time scale. And then moving on, allow the learners then to turn and talk and share their ideas. They can do this in different ways. So they can just chat about it. They might want to re record their ideas on a mini whiteboard, for example, and then open it up to the whole class. And if we were doing this um, in, a, a, in a sort of face-to-face -face environment, this is the way that I would present this. Open it up to the whole class and have everyone sharing those ideas. So what's the same but different? And as a practitioner, it might be worthwhile recording some of those ideas at the same time. For a practitioner at that point, it's your, your role there is to sort of summarise those main ideas and to try and pull out any of the important maths and numeracy from the discussions that you were listening to or the, the observations from what the children have recorded. And then the next step after that is, is that generalise and apply and asking your learners to potentially create another image that goes along those same lines, what's the same what but different. And they can do that working in partners. They might want to do it individually, but they're going to come up with a related same but different image. And again, it goes back to that sharing again. And it is important to emphasise, as I did, that word, but they're not making a choice. They're not going to prove that they are the same 
and um, sorry, they're not going to prove that these are the same or different. They're going to consider how the two items can be both. I've probably not explained that correctly, but I think looking at your chat, you've kind of got the idea. It is a critically important distinction. Um, so it's not the same or different, rather it's the same but different. So it's maybe worth a wee bit of um, modelling that with your learners if this is a process that they're unfamiliar with. And actually, when we're using the same but different routine, students are forced to really look at the features, the characteristics, the defining qualities of what we are comparing and can really help develop that mathematical thinking and lead into those problem solving skills that we're trying to promote. You can see here um, on the website that's on screen just now, there are lots of different types of these tasks available and they are suitable from early right through to fourth level so it's definitely worth um, investigating in those and having a go at them with your learners. So just before we kind of move on we want to talk, spend a little bit of time to look at a question that was posed and I mentioned this earlier on, a question that was posed during our last session what's um, in relation to learners using the same strategy. And we want to take a bit of time to highlight the importance of learners being able to use a range of methods. The national guidance, which is our experience and outcomes and our benchmarks, highlight the learning and progression in curricular areas and provide clarity on the national standards expecting, expected within each curriculum area at each level. They set out clear lines of progression in numeracy and maths. And within uh, numeracy and maths, there are eight skills embedded in the outcomes. And two of these, and you'll see them coming on the screen just now, two of these are select and communicate processes and solutions, which are plural, and justify choice of strategy used. So you can see here that the guidance is telling us that we're looking for learners to show they're working and explain their thinking in a range of ways. And as you can see, the emphasis on ensuring that learners have many tools in their toolbox, which allow them to select the most efficient strategy, depending on whatever the calculation is that they're being asked. So essentially, we're ensuring learners are numerate and can select and use strategies which are both efficient and effective. And these can provide opportunities for learners to process, communicate and interpret numerical information in a variety of contexts. And we, these skills that we're looking at just now can't be taught in isolation. The aim is that as learners progress through curriculum for excellence levels, they should be able to demonstrate sophistication and independence in their ability to demonstrate, link, transfer and apply the skills in a range of increasingly more challenging contexts. So, um, and the next, the other um, skills that we, I mentioned, there was eight, we'll kind of highlight them in the next slide which is just coming up just now. So we're hoping that that kind of answers that question that yes we know lear learners will have their favourite but it's up to us to try and expose them to lots of different ways to allow us to pick out any misconceptions but also to allow the learners to really show that depth of understanding. Okay just moving on. Great. So we really like this illustration of mathematical behaviours and it comes from Mike Askew. Um, so you might be familiar with that name already, definitely one Googling if, if you're not familiar with them. And this is as part of a really uh, interesting presentation on reasoning. And he starts with this quote, math is not a spectator sport. And we think that that really rings true. Learners really need to engage with maths. They need to think. And encouraging them to think and helping them get better at mathematical thinking is the big challenge. Mike Askew discusses how it's important that learners become fluent in the fundamentals of mathematics through varied and frequent practice with increasingly complex problems over time so that pupils can develop that conceptual understanding and the ability to recall and apply knowledge rapidly and accurately. Learners need to reason mathematically by following a line of inquiry, making conjectures, looking at relationships and, and making generalisations, but also by developing an argument or justifying their thought process and using accurate and effective mathematical language. And finally, we're looking for learners to solve problems by applying their mathematics to a variety of routine and non-routine problems, but it's with increasing sophistication. And that might include breaking down problems into a series of smaller steps, so chunking the information down and persevering 
persevering, sorry, when things get when they get stuck or when things are out with their comfort zone. What follows are some suggestions for learning activities that can help learners develop these reasoning skills. Okay. And again, these are just some of the skills here that we are absolutely promoting um, that we take time to really embed and ensure that our learners are developing these and can apply in lots of different ways. And it's the it's our job really to make sure that learners are being allowed to handle complex problems by being exposed to them. Let's just move on. Thank you. And again, just a range of the different ways that we are saying this isn't just about the, the problem solving skills that they'll be using within their learning environment, but these are lifelong skills. OK, just moving on. OK, so the problems need to be, and again, it's just going back to that, it's up to us to expose children and learners to these sort of more complex problems. They need to be difficult enough to be challenging, but not so difficult that learners are really stuck. And it's really when we think about that um, zone of proximal development, and you've maybe heard about that through your studies, teachers who get that this right create those resilient problem solvers who know what that perseverance is. And that's what we're trying to develop, that resilience in our learners, that they can persevere when things get stuck and they know what to do when they get stuck. Learners need opportunities to explain their ideas, but also to respond to the ideas of others. We need to challenge their thinking. And students who think math is all about getting the correct answer, and that's not just students that think that, that's beyond that. Lots of people just think math numeracy is about getting that correct answer. But if we do have learners who fall into that sort of bracket, it's up to us to support and encourage them to take risks. That tolerance of difficulty is essential if problem solving is to be achieved, because being stuck is an, a, one of the stages in resolving just about any problem. Getting unstuck typically, typically takes time and involves trying a variety of approaches, but students need to be learning this experientially. And really, again, an important thing that we would like you to take away today is it's not just about seeing problem solving as a series of steps. It can be messy and it should be messy. And really, you'll, you'll see some of the ideas on the screen just now about some of the questions and some of the approaches that might help develop that. OK, in this video clip, we're just going to stop for a second and, and let you hear this video clip. But this video clip by Dan Finkel, you'll see that on screen. He explores that concept of being stuck. He refers to it as the productive struggle. And as you're listening to it, just a wee bit of reflection time. In your own context, do we provide children with enough opportunities to be stuck? And how can we promote that resilience that I mentioned earlier on and that perseverance when they do get stuck? How can we help shift that mindset that sometimes being stuck is a negative thing and we're trying to make that being stuck and that um, having to ask for help is a natural part of the learning process? And as practitioners, do we model being stuck and what to do about it? Thanks, Jacqueline. Yeah, apologies. I think there's a bit of a lag when I'm sharing the slides. So oh, no, it's, it's not okay. that I've fallen asleep at the slides. It's just, no, I think, I don't know if my internet is not working. Um, not I'm going to play this. Can you just let me know if you can hear it? Um, I did share my audio, but I might need to unshare and share again. No worries. So I'll let you know when it's starting. Can you hear that? No, I can't, Jacqueline, I'm afraid. Okay. That's okay. Do you know what I'll do? I'll stop sharing um, and then I'll um, I'll uh, do it again because I think it cut the audio when earlier on. Okay. Hold on. Hi, I'm Dan Finkel, and I'm a That's us now. Yep. <laughs> Hi, I'm Dan Finkel, and I'm a math educator.
one of the things I get really interested in is what is the skill that's actually developing as students work more and more deeply in mathematics and go longer and longer in their careers? And I think there is one metric that explains almost the whole thing. And it is how long are you willing to be stuck on a problem? And what I found is young kids, maybe they can be stuck for 10 seconds or 20 seconds, maybe even a minute or two. And if they're really involved in like a playful experience, maybe even five or 10 minutes. Play kind of extends our ability to do this. As we get older, I don't know, maybe in grades three and four, you might see five minutes, 10 minutes. And ideally, in the upper grades, you're gonna see students increasing that to a half hour, an hour. By the time I was in graduate school, I feel like I was ready to spend a month stuck on a problem. And by the time you're a professional mathematician, maybe you need to spend many months or even years stuck on a problem. It is your willingness to be stuck in the productive struggle that defines how powerful you are as a mathematician. That is just one of the key components to the whole game. So here's, here's the deal. We need to teach that. Because if you're not teaching that, you are not helping your students to become better mathematicians. And what that means is you have to teach them to persist, to persevere, to struggle in a productive way, which means you have to give them the time to struggle. And this is the hardest thing as a teacher because there are so many demands on your time, so many learning targets, so many things, and yet, it is maybe the most critical thing to defend, to say there needs to be a time where my students can just dig into a problem that is worth doing and see if they can go longer today than they did the previous day. Get a little bit further before I step in to help them. Give them that time to extend themselves as problem solvers. Thank you, Jacqueline. Um, so just definitely worth reflecting back on that um, after the session and thinking about those opportunities that we provide and how do our learners cope with that and it won't be easy the first couple of times that you introduce and extend that time that they are being stuck but eventually you and them will see the benefits that, that can come from that so definitely one, one worth revisiting that one. So just moving on to some reflection points here. Um, the problem with problem solving. So a couple of points to reflect on here. All too often what we see is problem, problem solving, sorry, being timetabled as a separate element of numeracy and maths, perhaps being the numeracy and math um, lesson planned for a Friday. What we would advocate is that learners should be problem solving all the time, every day. And, and trying to bring that reasoning and that discussion and those open-ended approaches into everything that we're planning so that the children become those sophisticated thinkers. Again, another point here, just a bit of a, a cautionary note, really, um, to be careful if we're using displays to try and help learners that maybe match certain words to certain types of operations. So in problem solving, um, learners really need to be able to understand the context of the problem and not just look for the keywords. Additionally, some words can be used for more than one type of operation, particularly these days when we're encouraging learners to um, investigate different ways of calculating and, and solving calculations. And the one that comes to mind there is really that find the difference between it can be a subtraction but it can also be solved by counting on. So it's really just to be aware of that one and just to, to, to be cautious, I suppose. We're not saying get rid of these displays. We're just saying consider the question and think about do the words that are associated with those operations actually support the learners and will it, or will it hold them back? Okay, just moving on. And think about, just before we move on to the next one, the word problem that, that I've kind of put in there in the bubble. And if we just ask learners to pull out the, the appropriate language, they might look at the word share and they might look at that problem and say, oh, well, it's asking me to divide, which might lead them on to dividing 20 by, by 5 and reaching the answer 4, as opposed to solving that um, via a taking away. So that was really just to back up what I was saying there about being careful about the language and associating it with certain um, displays that we might have. Okay, word problems tend to be kind of complicated in part, sometimes because of the descriptive language. 
And sometimes learners don't really understand what it is they've been asked and how many times have learners said that to us, just tell me whether to add or subtract and then I'll be fine. They don't really know um, what the problem's asking them to do and there might be quite a lot of abstract concepts involved. Other issues, other issues sorry, arise when learners lack the fundamentals of maths and they can't actually formulate a plan for solving and they don't know what the next step might be. So that it's a complicated, a complicated process. I read a paper recently just in preparation for this and it was talking about the success of problem solving and the effectiveness of using knowledge in new situations being significant, uh, significantly influenced by the appearance and the context of the problem. And the paper went on to suggest the development of problem solving skills being related to the level of reading comprehension, which is absolutely um, true. So what I'm asking really and what we're, we're saying to consider here is What's best for our learners? You know your learners best. What's the best fit for them? Do all of the problems that we might present through that problem solving approach need to be presented in written form? Can they be read aloud? Can they be presented in a more multi-sensory fashion? And we all know the strategies that are used within our schools. They might look at draw a picture. They might want to add it out. And they, these are crucial. It's important that we give the learners time, space and structure to use that range of strategies and to think we're thinking here wider than numeracy and maths some of the skills that we've mentioned in the presentation so far can be transferred across the curriculum and beyond so really important that we give every opportunity to develop these moving on and we've mentioned and if you just click on thank you Jacqueline we've mentioned um many times before the words explore the word investigate and the phrases I wonder. And some of the activities that you're seeing just now are examples of ways to help to help promote the mathematical curiosity, which is so needed in our learners. There's an article um, produced by Enrich that shares the notion of the progression in developing curious learners and deep thinkers. And it talks about step one as being noticing. These learners that are just noticing tend to just describe what they see but they can benefit from prompts such as what's the same, what's different. Phase two or step two moves into a kind of wondering stage and that's where learners are beginning to ask their own questions, perhaps using prompts such as I wonder what would happen if or what might somebody else think, what might I do next. Step three might move on to them investigating and this is when we're looking at learners being problem solvers, sometimes drawing on resilience and perseverance which we've mentioned before being able to get stuck using mistakes and learning from those mistakes and trying maybe a different approach. And you can see where we want to get our learners to. We're moving into that investigating stage. Step four would be reflecting and creating. So these curious learners are both problem solvers, but also problem posers. They might devise a new problem to investigate. They might tinker with an earlier challenge. They might reflect on their learning, they might suggest hints for others um, to help them out and they might investigate similar problems. So you can see that each step um, is increasing their, their um, exposure but also developing those really uh, rich skills that we've spoke about. And again, there's a link there to a wakelet that's really useful if you're working at early level or beyond that, that will take you through being me and um, through block play and a lot of those curiosity and um, problem solving skills are absolutely built into that. So um, definitely worth looking at if you've not already. And just finally for me, we're going to look um, at some questions. So you'll see in the slide just now examples of some of the types of questions which will support that mathematical thinking and that deeper engagement that I've, I've tried to outline in the slides that I'm presenting. We're hoping that these um, will guide, support and stimulate learners. And these types of approaches provide opportunities to expose, expose and discuss common misconceptions and encourage reasoning rather than simply getting the answer. They also allow for creating connections between areas of learning and that's really important that they can see, learners can see those links and apply them in different contexts. And from your point of view, we're looking for you to model effective questions, value all responses and contributions and challenge correct and incorrect responses. Try to encourage metacognition to support and progress personal achievement. 
support your learners in developing their own ways of thinking and knowing when and how to use particular strategies for problem solving. And really what we want is for learners to think about what's the most effective strategy and why is that the most effective strategy. I'm going to pass to Yvonne um, just now who's going to share some examples of some problem solving activities that will develop some of those skills that I've mentioned. So it's over to you Yvonne. Thank you very much, Maria. And just a little reminder, um, Jacqueline has posted the link to register in the chat. If you are able to do that, um, quite a few of the local authorities like to kind of know how many people have been in attendance from their local authority. And it also helps us um, to find out if there's maybe particular local authorities where maybe our messages are not getting through about the courses. So if you are able just to click on that, all we ask um, is for you to click which local authority you are from. That's all that's required there. Um, so as Maria said, we're going to have a look at some of the different types of activities um, that can help to help embed that problem solving culture that Maria has been talking about. So first of all, I would like you to go to Menti. So you can either do that if you've got another device and you can use the code um, or you can if you are watching on your browser and um, you should be able to open a new tab and do that. And if you're just able to fill in which of these are you aware of, um, if you're not aware of any that's okay but it really just helps us see um, which ones people have heard of before so I'll give you a little minute to do that and that's great there is a few coming in there So hopefully tonight there, as we go through these ones, there'll be some which you maybe are a wee bit familiar with. There'll be some new ones that you can pick up and add into your toolbox there. Thank you for everybody that's filled that in. It looks like lots of people have heard of which one doesn't belong, open-ended questions and Venn diagrams, but not so much about some of the other ones. So I'll stop sharing there and I'll let Jacqueline put the slides back up again for us. Thank you very much, Jacqueline. So the first type of activity that we're going to have a look at is the um, which one doesn't belong. So that was one of the ones that, that people had clicked that they were familiar with. And you might have spotted that we have actually included a couple of these types of examples in some of our previous presentations. So this is where you give four different options and you ask learners to discuss which one is the odd one out. So which one doesn't belong. And ideally, you're looking for learners to be able to suggest a reason for why each one could be the odd one out. So this type of activity, it can be good as a starter at the beginning of a lesson or if you're wanting to recap maybe a previous task or you might want to use it to lead into something new um, and the the link at the bottom um, has lots of different examples that you can use and you can adapt and you can see that it doesn't always have to be numbers that you use in your examples um, you know you could use different objects shapes dice concrete materials even biscuits that was one that we sent around to our staff during maths week and these type of activities are good because you can show the whole class the same four options, but depending on their level of understanding, they're going to naturally differentiate the complexity of the reasons that they give. And it's a really good way to promote discussion between your learners because they can share which one they believe is the odd one out. Um, you know, one child might give you a reason for one and, and others might talk about um, a different one. So it's, it's good to kind of have that mathematical discussion going. The next type of activity that we've picked out is called Always, Sometimes and Never. And so in this type of activity, learners are given those statements. Um, as so they're given a, a, a mathematical statement and they've got to decide, is it something that is always true, sometimes true or never true? And so like in the previous activity, you could give the same question to a learner in primary five or an S5, and there's no doubt that they would give similar responses, but they are going to be able to differentiate kind of depending on their, their understanding. Um, and so 
when we think about their the kind of different expectations and their different reasonings that we give, we're also wanting them to justify it. So we can ask them, well, well how do you know? And the, the way that a learner will justify and the reasons that they give will differ depending on their mathematical understanding. So for some, it might just be a very basic explanation and some might be able to show it through diagrams or you know using concrete materials. Um, and it's also great that these questions um, get, get them to kind of explore that proof and explore that understanding and you can extend their thinking you might say to them well is there a way that you can change the statement so if they've said that it's sometimes true what can they change about the statement so that it is always true or so that it is never true in that kind of way Another type of activity which is really good to use is open-ended and also open-rooted questions. This can help learners to develop their problem-solving skills, but it's important that we understand the difference between open-ended and open-rooted. So an open-ended question provides opportunities for different strategies to be used to reach different possible solutions, whereas an open-rooted question means that different strategies can be used, but there's only one reasonable or possible solution. Now, you can see on screen, this is an extract from our pedagogy guide that sits on our professional learning community, and it focuses on open-ended questions. These type of questions are great for differentiation because they allow multiple entry points and learners don't feel like, oh, they are always getting the easy or they're always being given the hard questions. And these type of questions can provide a really good um, assessment opportunity because you can observe the different approaches that learners are using and notice where any misconceptions might lie. And so if you visit the Education Scotland Guide, you will see that there's also links to different websites that have got different examples of where you can get open-ended questions and also some further reading if you're interested in finding out more about it. Now, if you joined us at session four, you'll hopefully remember that we showed you this slide. This is an example of how a question can be used in an open rooted way. So there is only one possible solution of 62, but by asking learners to discuss how did they get there, you begin to discuss and understand the different strategies that they're using. And as we mentioned before, this is really important in helping learners to understand that there can be more than one way of solving things. We'll just let the slides catch up there. Now, I know that when I was um, first kind of starting out in the classroom, I spent a lot of time searching for specific problem solving questions. Um, you know, and I, I found that I was taking a lot of time when I was trying to kind of get my resources together, you know, looking through things and that was too challenging and that wasn't quite at the right level, um, you know, things that were needing a lot of adaptations. And actually, if we get better at changing the wording of questions which already exist in the likes of textbooks and workbooks, then you'll find that you can have a ready-made question that and really all you've had to do is kind of make a few small word and tweak. So on the next slide, in the first example, the learners are asked to calculate the perimeter of the shape. However, if we think about how can we open that question up a little bit more, how could we ask it in a slightly different way, if we were to reword this question, you will see that that then makes it much more open. And so it requires learners to interpret the questions carefully before they decide on the different ways that they could solve this and how they might present their solutions. And on the next slide, we've got an extract that comes from a maths blog. It talks about the different ways that you can open up a closed question. So you can see things like how you can turn around a question from a closed to an open, or how you might ask for explanations in a question, or how you might change some of the words to soft words, and how that kind of then changes it into um, a much more open question than it maybe is already appearing as. So we hope that you'll save this slide um, and you can refer back to it when you're trying to find out ways to make some questions more open.
So I'm going to give you a little minute in the chat. If you choose one of these questions, can you think about if you were to change the wording slightly, how could you make that more of an open ended question? That's great. We've got some examples coming through in the chat there. So instead of having a list of, you know, what is five add five, what is six add four, what is seven add three, you might say, how many ways can we make 10? Or can you show me X number of ways to make 10 using two different numbers if you want to be a bit more specific? OK, somebody's put a, a kind of word question in there. So instead of saying how many five pences to make 45 pence, um, Barry goes to the shop and spends 45 pence on sweets. How many ways could he pay using coins? I, or I'm trying to make 45 pence. What coins could I use to make this? That's great. And I think I saw one for the top one there. How many different ways could you show 32 multiplied by 15? What strategies would you use to solve 32 times? So thank you there. That's great ones there. So hopefully you can see that actually, um, you know, a lot of questions exist and it is just about kind of tweaking the word in a little bit to make them more open. And another site which has some good examples of open questions is called Open Middle. And all of these links that we talk about tonight will be on that Padlet that um, we give you the link to. So on Open Middle, you will see that there are um, questions that you can lift. And, um, you know, you can ask learners to take part in them, depends on the level of understanding, depends on the, the strategy and solution that they might give you. And also, um, you know, have the, the kind of ability to amend these for your own learners. So when I looked at this one, I thought, you know, if I was to then add a zero in and, add, and say to them that they could use the digits from zero to nine, that would then encompass pretty much all of the learners in my class. You know, everybody would be able to access that at some level. But then some of my other learners, I could maybe challenge them to see, could they use a two digit number um, in part of their calculations? So again, just with a little tweak there, I can make it a bit more accessible in terms of differentiating for the needs that are within my class. And then there's also some further examples that come from Open Middle. It is quite an American site, um, so you need to click on the year group that suits your le learner's level best and just to be aware of some of the wording and things can be American spelling. But there's different um, sections on the Open Middle website, so there's calculations, but there's also things like um, data handling. And I'm going to hand you over to Jacqueline, who is also going to talk about some of the different type of problem solving activities, including some data handling ones as well. Thank you. Um, so what we're going to do now is we're, we're just going to look at um, one more approach, I think. Um, yeah, one more approach, and then we're going to have a quick screen break because we are aware it's quite a lot of listening after the end of a day. So what we're going to look at, first of all, here is an approach called numberless word problems. Um, and I don't know if you find that when you're you're carrying out word problems with your learners that they basically just go straight to grab the numbers um because i know that i did but i also probably m should confess that i do that myself i think it's whether we're always in a rush and you're just trying to find the quickest way to do things but actually we're not taking in what the question's actually asking and neither are the learners when we're doing this so what numberless word problems can do is really just slow down everything and stop learners from doing that number grabbing so let's look at this first um, wee bubble of text here. I'll give you a wee moment to read that. Um, and then I want you to put in the chat what maths you see in that question, or not question in that statement. OK, thank you. We've got some fewer. Great. Okay. okay, what you might find when you do this with learners, and this is exactly how I would do it, I would just show them the sentence or sentences and I would say what maths is there. And you'll probably find that they'll, they'll look at you as if you've grown another head. What, what you ask me, there's no numbers here, how can there be maths? But actually just say, have a look again. And, and because you're teachers, you know to look for the maths and things, you're trained to do that. 
the learners aren't always quite as quick to get there as we are. So we just give them that time. And I think one of the biggest things that we're probably promoting today is 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 that thinking time. And we talk about it a lot. And I know, we'll know that you've heard about it lots of other places, but the power of actually being able to pause and give them time to think and not take answers too quickly. It's just, it's so powerful, um, although difficult for us to do as teachers quite often as well. So I would do that, ask them where the math is, and then I would re reveal the next part of it. So you're just revealing a wee bit more information. So we do have a number now, but what do we know? So what new information do we have? That was That's what I would ask them. And if you're comfortable, stick it in the chat just now, just to keep your, your brain going as well. What do we know now? Just with this extra bit put in. Okay, so good. Yeah, we know that there's less than 135 adults in the hall. We know the quantity of the children. Um, yep. Okay. So again, it's just giving them that time. And probably some of you were sitting there going, "This is a really awkward silence," <laughs> but that is just what it is, and you just get you just get used to you just get used to it. Um, and then, so you want to do that? Have a, a bit of dialogue. I'm going quickly through it today, just because of time purposes. But um, you know, you would take that time with it with the learners, and. Finally, you would just reveal the last part of information. So now we've got 135 children were in the, in the lunch hall and 15 fewer adults than children were in the lunch hall. So we now know some more information. I would ask them what's the new information that we've got here. Um, and then but what you will notice here is that we don't actually have a question yet. So it's still just statements. There are no questions yet. And it's up to you how you do this with your learners. You could ask them to create their own or you could just then ask the questions having given them information in a much slower way try different things see what works see what you get the most out of your learners with um, but it, it can be quite good to get them to generate the questions but you will need to give them that wee bit of support and structure um, when they're beginning it as well this approach that I've talked about tonight I've given you the kind of fast track version of it what I would say is if you go down to that um, numberless word problems link at the bottom teaching to the beat of a different drummer it tells you the story of how some this uh, one teacher in America introduced it um, and it's a really nice story the way she tells it's really nice and it gets you quite motivated and you think yeah I really want to try that with my learners so it's worth having a read at that it's just one page on the internet um, and also the other link there the bee stalkers gives you lots of examples uh, similar to what Yvonne was saying about the website um, she gave you in the previous slide is it is very Americanized but it's just to get it gives you food for thought gives you ideas of where to start there's also some really good support in how to create your own numberless word problems as well um, which can, is really useful um, but actually it's quite easy to do it's not something that you have to go hunting for you, you'll probably be able to convince lots of questions from your own textbooks that you've got access to quite easily as well. Is it something I would use with every single word problem? No, nope, it would take too long, we don't have time, but it's something to do every now and then and it's a good way to prompt that rich discussion that can provide that scaffold to support the learners um, and really paying attention to the information in the language in a much deeper way than maybe they would normally do as well. And as I said, it might take a wee bit getting used to to begin with. So you might need to try it a few times before you actually win them over with that one. If you do choose to try the numberless word problems, um, these are just some of the questions that can be beneficial to use when you're using, um, using them. However, there is quite a lot of questions here. We wouldn't obviously suggest that you use them all at once. Just pick out the ones that you think fit your situation. I think it's always good to have as much information as you can and then pick out what's appropriate um, to you and your children. Um, and as I mentioned in the previous slide as well, it's a good idea to get learners to create their own questions, but it might take a wee bit of time to get there, first of all. This next slide here is just some more examples and well one more example of what it might look like as well um, and another link to some other examples that you can use and the text on the left here just it highlights how this approach can help to develop that mathematical thinking and um, there's there's so much um, richness that these types of activities can um, can give our learners and us as well but it's just kind of being brave and trying them as well. So we're going to have a wee break just now because I think it's well deserved. It's been a long day. Um, so that's um, 4.53. We'll come back at 4.58. Um, feel free to stand up, walk away from your screen or state your screen, whatever you want to do. For those of you that stay, have a wee look at this, the image you can see in the screen and just note in the chat, what do you notice and what do you wonder? And just take your time. If you don't want to 
take part in the task, that's fine. Stretch your legs, whatever. But we'll come back at 4.59. Move on now. Um, thanks to some of uh, those of you that put some suggestions in the chat and hopefully you've had a chance to just have a wee look at it um, even if you've not had a chance to type anything in. So this approach that we're going to look at now is called slow reveal graph. So similar to the numberless word problems, it is about releasing information at a much slower pace rather than releasing it all at once to the learners. Um, so it's called slow reveal graphs, but it can also be known as numberless graphs or notice and wonder graphs as well. And essentially, these are graphs which are gradually introduced with a wee bit more information at each stage. Um, and in this approach, again, similar to before, it gives learners time to think and wonder um, and, and discuss what they might they think might be happening. And as more and more of that graph is revealed, they, they begin to define their interpretation of what they think it is. And quite often in surprising ways as well, um, which can be nice and it can be good fun as well. So looking at the chat, we can see that some people have noticed some different things. Um, and maybe some of you who are looking at this are starting to wonder what the graph might be about. And this is just exactly, again, how I would do it with the learners. I would show them the graph with the missing parts um, and have a discussion about what they notice and what they wonder. And again, they might be a bit reluctant at first, but the more you use this approach, the more comfortable they'll become and, and the richer the dialogue will become over time as well. Learners also need to feel safe and it's really important to value all their contributions and, and don't be afraid of that wait time. As I said before, it's it's essential um, if you're going to use an approach like this as well. So try not to be too quick to take suggestions. And I think we've all been guilty of that at some point. Um, I know I, I definitely have. So you've had a time to look at this graph. You've, you, you've time to look at it, make some note, make some observations. And then what I would do next is release the next part of information. So. You can see here that we've got one of the axes has um, the increments are now shown. So, what new information do we have? Have a wee look at that. Have a wee think about it. And also think: Has this changed your thinking in any way? What do we wonder now? And I would just I would take that time, have that discussion. It's very difficult in this virtual setting. So I'll just move on quickly so that we've got time to get through everything else as well. And again, you, you would then reveal the next part. Thank you very much, Rona. Um, you would reveal the next part um, where you've now got some new information. And again, stop, take that time. What new information do we have here? Is it anything that's surprising you? Is it, has it changed the way that you're thinking? What might be on the x-axis? These are all questions that you might ask. So have a wee think yourself, what do you think might be on that x-axis? It's going to be types of animals. Which animals do you think might be in here? Okay, and again, I would give them longer and I'd give them time to discuss. So fish might be in there. Feel free to keep chatting and crocodile. I mean, it could be anything really, but if you're looking at the numbers of teeth, um, I suppose that, that limits it in some way, so might have sharks. Okay, you can see here that, that we now have the story. So we have, we've got the full information there. So what story is this graph telling us? What can you, what, what have you learned from this graph? Is it anything that surprised you again? And what it would do is just take time having that discussion with, with the class, uh, the, the learners in front of you as well. What I'm doing here is I'm just putting on the right hand side there again the problem solving skills that this will help to develop using this sort of approach. So once you've revealed that last part, you can see we can see lots of new information, have that discussion, and similar to the numberless word problems, it just it slows the process right down and it just encourages learners to pay attention to the detail rather than rushing to answer the preset questions. It can also help to reduce the cognitive overloads as information is just revealed that wee bit at a time. We've also probably all seen a page, a textbook page that's got a graph printed at the top and loads of questions um, after it. And it can be quite overwhelming for some learners and I know that those tend to be the really busy um, textbook pages as well. And for some it's just too much to take in at once. So, it, you know, it can either be that or also learners will just work robotically through them without actually really taking that time to analyse information in any depth. So this just moves away from that approach. And again, it's not to say not to use the textbook pages, it's just to say that this will pull out more 
And if you're wanting to discuss and promote a wee bit further learning, deeper learning, then a, this is the approach we'd use. They can then go, of course, go away and complete textbook pages if you feel it's appropriate as well. It's just what's right for your for your learners. Okay. Oh, and just I wonder if it's worth bringing in the question from the car park at this point, just when you're talking about cognitive overload. Mm hmm. Um, so there's a, a question in the car park about um, supporting pupils who've got additional support needs, um, you know, that they might be um, very confident with maths, but in the likes of a word problem, um, you know, where it's it's kind of using different thinking skills, they might become upset um, or, or they find that difficult. Um, and, you know, Jacqueline and Maria, feel free to, to kind of come in here. But I, just when Jacqueline was talking about that cognitive overload, um, you know, it reminded me of some of the pupils that I had worked worked with previously and you know sometimes that word question just is too overwhelming and you know as Jacqueline spoke about in this approach and the approach before about the the kind of numberless word problems you know do they have to see the word problem all at once you know can you show a bit at a time um you know if it's to do with literal thinking you know can you change it so that it's a scenario that they maybe have more experience of you know if it's too abstract for them they're maybe not going to understand it um you know or is there a way that you could maybe make it more more um, visual for them, you know, can you use some concrete materials that will then be helped to scaffold it for them, um, if that word problem is just too overwhelming for them, thinking about how you can either strip it back or, or scaffold it up for them. Um, Jacqueline or Maria, I don't know if there's um, anything you want to, to add on that bit. Yeah, no, I would agree. And I think the thing it's important for us to remember as well, that it is, it is maths that we're looking to develop here. It's not literacy. Now it does help if they, they're able to read the questions but for some learners that's just not possible and it, it depends on how complex their, their difficulties are um, but it may be appropriate that you read the question to them at times as well and I know that in some exam situations as they go through that's not always going to be possible but if a learner does have a recognised disability and they are provided with support on a day-to-day -day basis they are entitled to that support in an exam situation as well so it's just keeping that in mind as well and just you know that they're not expected to be doing all the things that other people are doing all the time as well and I think just offering them that reassurance you know don't don't feel stressed about this it's okay let's let's look at it together and um, rather than them feeling that it's all on them as well yep and Maria same pose in alternative formats as well through a story or an everyday day routine yep so we don't have a magic wand, but hopefully these are some suggestions that might help um, as well. And then just going back to this low reveal graphs, there's just this one here. I wanted to highlight the link at the bottom here because it's a nice um, graph that you might be able to use. It's linked to environmental um, weight, the impact of food that we waste. It's probably more appropriate for second level, but it is a nice example. And again, a lot of the examples on this website are very Americanized. They talk about candy, they talk about various different things, um, but it's, it's good to have a look at to get some food for thought as well. So the next approach we're going to look at is called goal-free problems, uh, the goal-free approach. Um, and it's, there's, there's similarities to the, the previous approach as well, but instead of providing learners with a stimulus and lots of questions at one time, you just provide the stimulus. So in this case, you're just providing the graph, but it doesn't have to be a graph. It could be that you provide them a shape or a 3D object or a pattern, or it could be collections of money or, or anything, anything that you feel is appropriate. could even be something that they bring to you, depending on the level you're at as well. And once again, you just simply ask the learners, what do you notice? So what do you notice? Type it in the chat just now, if you feel comfortable. Of course. Okay, so people are starting to draw some general conclusions um, from looking at that graph. And that's one way that learners might look at it. Um, th there's just lots of different uh, things that you'll, you'll get from learners about that. And I'll talk about that in a wee moment. Um, what we've also linked to here is this the Sweller paper. Um, and it talks about solving traditional problems which have a specific goal and that being very cognitively demanding, particularly for children when it's in an unfamiliar context. And, and we all know that learners do find applying learning to an unfamiliar context much more challenging. And that's how we know whether they're secure in what they're doing or not as well. And this is really because the solution can only be found by completing all the different steps that lead up to it. And because there's so many steps involved, it can result in that failure to solve the problem. Um, because there's just there's too many things going on and it's too stressful for them and then that can cause them to disengage as well. 
But when a context is presented with no specific goal, so you're not telling them what they've got to do with that information, then it can be explored at a level that's appropriate to each learner. And it's great for differentiation, this approach, because you could use this with various groups and they'll all get different, they'll access it in different ways. And the solutions to lots of different problems can actually be found through discussion as well. And quite often when you're having that discussion of what do you notice, then actually a lot of the traditional questions that would be asked will actually be answered, but in a much more natural way. Um, and so what you might find is some people have started to make um, different um, conclude, draw different conclusions um, and have on there's put in 121 people completed the survey. So some will just say there was um, good was the most popular. Um, the least popular um, choice was unsure. There was the least amount of people were unsure. But you'll see from what Yvonne's put is some learners will actually start to add them together. So you can and you can challenge people. Well, do you know what else do you know? So if they, they give you something and you think, mm, I think they're capable of more, you can say, well, what else do you know? Some people might start to calculate the difference between the most and the least popular. Some people might um, try to work out what are the po what's the total of the popular um, choices and what, you know, the positive ones like excellent and good or what the total of, of the not sure um, or the, the, you know, the not happy about it um, examples are there as well. So there's lots of different ways that this can be accessed. And in this example, as I said, it's just using a graph, but it could be anything, any other item that you want to use. It could even be a measuring jog or anything like that as well. So there's lots that you can do with that. But the, the point of this really is that um, it's it, you're not giving them the questions you're taking away some of that cognitive overload and really just in, in, encouraging that rich dialogue around it as well so this next slide here shows some more examples at various different levels um, and once you've given learners a chance to work out whatever they can with that information or make lots of observations then you if you want you can then share a goal specific question you don't have to it's up to you it depends again on your learners and what's right for your situation but what if you do choose to do that then learners should at that point realize that they've done the hard work already they've already answered the question through their discussions and actually it might just be a final tweak that's needed and um, we have a, a mini guide available at education scotland that's got a kind of, it's just a few pages long and it just shows you what goal free problems are what they look like, some examples, and where you can get some more examples um, and, and more information if you want to find out a bit more about it. So that was goal-free problems. Um, this next approach is called same surface, different depth. And these problems are a special type of problem based on an the observation that the correct solution to most mathematical problems involves two steps. The first step being to identify the strategy needed to solve the problem, and then the second step to successfully carry out that strategy that's been identified. So the learner is actually presented with a number of questions, a number of problems, which at first glance look quite similar, but each of them actually requires a different strategy to solve it. And the learners really need to read the questions carefully, whether that's with support from you or not, or um, through discussion with peers, that's absolutely fine as well, to really help them to identify that correct strategy. So just have a wee look, I'll give you a moment or two just to look at all of these problems um, and try and work out the skills that are being used in each of them. Just give you a wee moment or two to think about that. And apologies, there's a typo in the last box there. <laughs> How many apples could I buy for one pound? So apologies about that. So yeah, somebody's... Um, Say different addition and subtraction strategies are being used. Absolutely. Okay, I've given you a wee bit of time to think. I, I, I would give, I would like to give you longer, but we'll need to move on. Um, and then just in the left-hand side here, this is just how the, the problem-solving skills that this can help to develop, how it can help children to become those mathematical uh, reasoners as well. These can be used in a different, lots of different ways. You could maybe use them as homework tasks or as a mean of, means of revision or for assessment as well. Um, what you really want to do is kind of revisit previous concepts that they've been taught um, at, at spaced intervals and just over periods of time just to kind of go back, dip into that, um, those skills that they've previously developed. And just there at the bottom, there's a, a link to lots and lots more examples. And then we've got some more examples on the next page as well, just again, various different levels. Um, these examples have been taken from a website created and curated by Craig Barton. Some of you may have heard of him. 
Um, it's quite a high profile writer about mathematics, te teaching in mathematics. And the site has got so many different problems that are free to download. A lot of them are for secondary, but a lot of them are not as well. So it's worth having a wee look at that rather than trying to reinvent the wheel and um, take what you can from there as well. So we're near, we're getting to the end. If you're, I appreciate you're probably getting tired and fed up sitting. Um, so just a few more things to go through um, and then we'll be done. We just wanted to kind of draw your attention to the Venn diagrams. Um, they seem to be one of the ones that was most popular that people had heard about when we looked at the wee um, presentation at the beginning of, of what strategies you'd used. Um, but actually, they're really good in encouraging that deep mathematical thinking and exploring the relationships, um, the mathematical relationships to each other of various different things as well. So what learners can do is sort and classify a given set of objects into two different sets using attributes such as shape or colour. At early level, it might be two hula hoops which are separate, they don't yet overlap, and then this can then progress into overlapping hoops. You might have two overlapping, you might have three overlapping as it gets more challenging. Um, but it's also important that we present le learners with um, items that actually don't fit any of these sets as well. So for example, if I said where would a blue circle go, the answer would be, oops, apologies, would be outside of the, of the Venn diagram and it's important not to kind of skip that out because it's really important and um, because in real life information doesn't always or data or whatever doesn't always fit nicely into the boxes that we set so it's important that we look at that with them as well and we do have another, um, another mini guide available in Venn diagrams that talks a wee bit more about it. A quick task for you just to keep you alert um, in this one here we've got a um, odd numbers, multiple of three, um, and then we've got them overlapping. So we've got some examples and you can see that we've got some that don't lie within either of these categories. And again, that's great. What I want you to do is come up with something that could be A. So A is within this green hoop, but it's not within the red hoop and it's not overlapping both of the hoops. So type in the chat a number that could be A or that A could be, sorry. Okay, great. Go ahead and go for B, C and D. Just type B and the number, C and the number and D and the number so we know which one you're talking about as well now. Now remember if it's B then it can't be an odd number as well. Otherwise, it would be in C, in this, this part here. <laughs> no, it's okay, don't worry. I've probably made the exact same mistake myself as well when we were putting this together. Okay, I'm just going to move on. It was just to kind of keep your brains going, but I don't want to push you too hard at the end of a long day as well. Okay. We have covered a lot again tonight, as we always do, um, and there's always, always more that we could cover, but we, you know, within the time that we've got, we do what we can, um, but you can find out a wee bit more in our professional learning community, um, which you do need go access. Um, if you go into the learning teaching assessment section, there's a developing mathematical thinking tile, um, and then there's also all of these um, tiles are within that that you can go in and there's loads of problem solving um, activities in there. So it's worth taking a wee bit of time um, just to look at that and again of course that counts as your um, CPD hours as well, it counts towards it, anything that you're trying to develop your own professional learning, um, you can put that down towards it um, and some more there, sorry as well. As I said, it is a lot to take in and we wouldn't expect you to go away and try all of it tomorrow but it is good to try and pick something that's caught your attention today. Um, and it's just something that you thought, oh, oh, I'd like to try that and try that out within the next few days if you can, the quicker you try it out the more likely you are to embed some of these ideas and the more likely that coming to sessions like this will have a wee bit or have some sort of impact on what you're doing as well. What I want to do is go back to the Menti. There are some reflective questions here, but you can look at them in your own time. Go back to the Menti just now and have a wee think about what activity do you think you are you would like to try out first uh, based on what you've seen today? So I'll just give you a wee moment or two to do that.
and we'll share the results in just a moment so you can see as well. And there's a one sharing them, that's great. So, so far, we've, the slow reveal graphs are, are showing as popular. Um, yep, just watching these as they, as, they, as they rise up. And it's good to see there's a balance. There's, you know, people voting for, for most of them as well. Hopefully something has struck a chord with you today and you thought, oh, I thought of that. Sounds quite good. Well, that's great to hear, Mrs. Brown. I think that, that if you've been looking at data handling, then that'll be a really nice way of assessing what they've actually learned within that as well and, and help you to identify what your next steps will be. So that, that'll be a good, good one to look at as well. Okay, I'm just going to move on now, um, just to do the last few final slides. Um, hold on, I'm just going to share my screen again. So as I said, these are some reflective questions. It is worth taking a bit of time to look at them and think about your own practice and, and how you're going to adapt that going forward. Um, because typically problem solving is something that people do find much more challenging because we are trying to push learners a wee bit further. Um, you know, and, and develop that learning and enhance that learning. So it's just take time, stop, don't put too much pressure on yourself to solve all the problems at once. Just work on one thing at a time and see if that starts to make a difference with your learners. As with all previous sessions, all the links from this session will be found on the Padlet, um, which Yvonne will stick in the chat in a wee second. Um, in this second column here, all the presentation materials from all previous sessions um, and the recordings are in within that, and we'll add the recording to this within a, a few days. Um, Ian, who uh, records the sessions for us, is always great and always gets them back to us nice and sharp, so we'll, we'll add that to that um, within the next day or so as well. Um, because there were so many links within this problem-solving um, session, I've actually just put all the links onto one Word document and added it to the Padlet, so you'll see that when you go in as well. The next session is Introduction to Teaching Time. Um, that will be session six. We're really fairly powering through these sessions and thank you for staying with us um, for them as well. Um, and you can register using the QR code. I would suggest that you register as quickly as possible. If you don't register for the session, then you won't get sent out the information about it. Um, we just kind of have to register one by one uh, because we've had quite a lot of dropouts and new starts and various things like that. So it's just much easier for us to have you register for each session at a time. And then I will email every single person that emails uh, that registers with the link to join in case it doesn't automatically get sent out. So um, please do register for that. Um, and the link for that will go into the chat just shortly as well. Um, I'll come back to that in a wee moment as well. We did talk about the midpoint evaluation. Um, if you would like to complete that and you haven't already completed it, um, you can drop me an email and I can send you the link um, or you can hang on or not hang on, but you can um, take the, a note of that and complete that later on. Um, but it does really help us kind of identify what our next steps would be for the rest of the programme so that we are meeting your needs rather than just plowing on with what we think you want. This is just some links and some references from today. Um, we've, we've put the, the links, the, the hyperlinks onto the Padlet, but these are just some further reading if anybody's interested they want to have a look as well. Maria mentioned earlier on, but I know that some people were a bit late in joining about the regional support teams. Um, there was a low in uptake for the first session due to various things. There was parents nights, there was staff meetings, and also just some people just weren't aware that they were on. And that's absolutely fine. It's very, very busy out there. We know what it's like. Um, but as Maria said earlier, it's very informal. Just come along, even if you don't have anything you want to bring up and you want to listen to what other people are, are asking. It tends to be that people come along, like they might say, oh, I'm, I'm about to start teaching measure. I don't know where to start. Or um, I was teaching data and analysis and I found this really hard. Is there any ways I can get around about that? Or, or, or you just want to chat to other people. It's just a great opportunity to come along. It's not a formal presentation. It really is just let's have a chat. Um, so you're welcome to come along. You can see here which local authority, your regional improvement, your, sorry, which regional improvement collaborative, your authority um, as a member of, and these are the codes to join, and the, those are the dates for the session. So please do join them if you're able to, um, because they're useful. But also we do appreciate that it's very busy, so don't feel the pressure to either. 
Um, and what I'll do is I'll go back to the registration for the next session. Um, Maria and Yvonne and I will hang on if anybody has any questions. Um, absolutely happy to stay on and just have a wee chat with anybody. Um, other than that, you're free to go and thanks for bearing with us after a long day on um, quite a heavy subject, but we do appreciate your time tonight. So thank you very much for coming along.